Witam serdecznie wszystkich obecnych w imieniu, w imieniu swoim. Rafał Pankowski w imieniu organizatorów, współorganizatorów dzisiejszego spotkania Domu Spotkań z Historią, Stowarzyszenia Nigdy Więcej i Fundacji Heinricha Bela Biuro w Phnom Penh. W planie dzisiejszego spotkania mamy, mamy kilka punktów, z czego pierwszym punktem, jak Państwo zapewne wiecie, jest film, film dokumentalny dotyczący tego, co zdarzyło się w Kambodży w drugiej połowie lat 70. Później wysłuchamy prezentacji, wykładu na ten temat, a później przejdziemy do, do dyskusji. Now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Timothy Williams, or I should say Dr. Timothy Williams. Congratulations on your recent and, and well-deserved PhD on Cambodia, I believe. Uh, Tim um, is a research uh, fellow um, in the University of Marienburg uh, in the Department of Conflict Studies, and he has done extensive research uh, on genocide and on uh, the atrocities in Cambodia in particular, and Tim is going to give us more context on on what happened in, in Cambodia in the late 70s and what the legacy is of that tragedy. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak here. Um, <clears throat> so we've had a very good introduction to uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, through the film. Um, but what I would like to do in my uh, presentation today is to talk a little bit about the, the men and women um, who fought for the Khmer Rouge um, and were cadres of the Khmer Rouge and a, a little bit about their life, uh, how they came to be in these positions uh, at the time uh, and uh, how they're seen today. Now, the documentary... Um, is an interesting time capsule, as it was made in 1990, and we've had 27 years of history since. Um, so in between, I will try and sort of refer back to how Cambodian society has continued developing um, today. So as we heard, um, I mean, the Khmer Rouge uh, genocide uh, is not as well known as many other uh, mass killings uh, of the 20th century, for instance, um, Rwanda, or obviously um, the Holocaust. Mm, but nonetheless, um, one point, between 1.7 and 2.2 million people um, died uh, in the space of um, three years, eight months, and 20 days. These are sort of three numbers which every Cambodian knows uh, between 1975 and 1979. And this is about 2 million people of a population of 8 million. So a quarter of the population died uh, in this short period of time. And... Ha about half of them, so about one million people, died of disease and hunger, um, and about the other half was actively killed um, by the Khmer Rouge because they belonged to a certain group of people that the Khmer Rouge were trying to eradicate. The, the Khmer Rouge came to power um, after a, a five-year civil war uh, between uh, the U.S.-backed uh, Lon Nol, um, a former general, and um, his uh, and the, the Khmer Rouge themselves. And so when, and it was a very brutal civil war, and so when this, uh, the Khmer Rouge came to power, they were welcomed with open arms um, to the, uh, let me, yeah. Um, I, I, I have mostly just pictures. Um, it's not a very informative PowerPoint, but just gives you some in, uh, maybe some impressions of, uh, of the country as well. So they, the Khmer Rouge came to power after a very brutal civil war, and they were, they were very much welcomed. But very soon they tried to implement their dystopian vision of a sort of a, a, um, a, a Maoist, uh, communist, 
uh, ideal, uh, in which they wanted to sort of turn back uh, the, the clock of development back to what they called the year zero and implement an, a peasant revolution and rebuild the whole country from Cambodian force. It was a very nationalist revolution as well. And so everyone was sent into the countryside um, the narrator also spoke about this in the, in the documentary. Um, and everyone had to work in the fields and build irrigation and um, build rice. And to begin with, the Khmer Rouge um, started to eradicate all the former people who'd been associated with the regime of Lan Nol. Uh, they got rid of as many of the intellectuals as they could find. Um, and then gradually they also started uh, eradicating uh, the ethnic minorities, uh, the Cham minority, and particularly the Vietnamese uh, minority. And after about a year, it became clear that their economic policies weren't working. And rather than to question whether um, it was the policies which were, had much too high expectations in terms of how much rice should be built in the country, they said that it must be due to internal traitors. And so within the regime, they started looking for these traitors, so-called internal enemies. And so from then on, anyone uh, could be suspected as being um, a, a traitor. And then they were normally framed as CIA or KGB agents or as Vietnamese agents. And so then... Um, these, there was a sort of a gradual um, paranoia within, within the Khmer Rouge. There were lots of internal purges, so a lot of Khmer Rouge cadres themselves um, were also killed. And this continued until 1979 when uh, the Vietnamese invaded the country, uh, liberated the country. Um, but then the civil war, as you heard, carried on until well into the 90s after the, this documentary. Uh, there was a UN mission which... Um, had some good points, but also failed in many important points. Um, but then in the 1990s, uh, the war came to an end, um, and there's been a process of peace uh, and of development since then. Um, but an interesting thing that uh, the, the narrator of the film said was that the people who at this torture prison, Tul Sleng, uh, had been the perpetrators were still at liberty because of the civil war. Well, even when the civil war ended, um, only the leader of this prison was put on trial. Um, and until today, uh, there have only been three sentences uh, in, in uh, an international court um, and none before local courts. Uh, of people who participated in the Khmer Rouge regime. Instead, there's been an effort to integrate the people and to return to peace. Now, I've spent um, about um, 10 months, nine months over the last uh, three years in Cambodia. Uh, there you can see me with my research assistant. Um, traveling around the country, um, we did uh, interviews with um, 58 different uh, former Khmer Rouge cadres across 10 different provinces um, of the country. And my, um, and my focus, um, I mean, I've also spoken with other victims, and I've also done some research with um, organizations in Phnom Penh, but the, the main focus of my research has been uh, these Khmer Rouge cadres. And what I'd like to do now um, is talk a little about, a bit about why they became uh, perpetrators, why they used violence within their roles, um, but then also talk a little bit about how they see themselves as victims um, also of the Khmer Rouge regime, how they also portray themselves as heroes, and to try and talk a little bit about why these different self-perceptions of themselves, not just as perpetrators, is also quite broadly accepted across society. Okay, so the main topic that comes up when you're talking to former Khmer Rouge cadres is that they had no choice. That if they hadn't have participated, they would themselves have instantly been killed. And this is, um, this is true. There are lots and lots of examples of people, even um, for much lesser things than refusing to kill, uh, even for not 
working quick enough on a rice field, you could be killed. So even disobeying an order as, as important as killing someone else, you, it was very likely that you yourself uh, would then be punished in this way. So this is it's a very, very coercive environment, much more so than, for instance, uh, during the Holocaust or during the Rwandan genocide. This is probably the most totalitarian regime uh, that uh, we've had during the 20th century. Um, and at the same time, uh, the Khmer Rouge had uh, the organization uh, was called Ankar, and Ankar itself was synonymous with authority. Um, whatever a Khmer Rouge cadre who was a member of Ankar um, ordered had to be um, followed. Um, and so within this setting, um, people... Uh, accepted also the way that the Khmer Rouge was presenting reality to them. And so also here on the slide, I have the word ideology. Now, most people didn't believe in the ideology, the Maoist ideology of the Khmer Rouge. In fact, most of them had been small landowners themselves beforehand, and so they didn't like the processes of losing their land to collectivization. But they did accept this idea of a threatening enemy, and they did believe that there were CIA agents and Vietnamese agents within the country trying to destroy the nation. And so they bought into this, and um, they, they accepted this new world view that the Khmer Rouge was providing to them. Even if this wasn't necessarily the motivation for them to actually kill these people, it made it a lot easier for them, and it did justify to them why they were participating in this. And also, a lot of the people I spoke to um, talked to me about... Um, their hopes when they joined the Khmer Rouge of having a better life. As we heard, it was extremely difficult. There was mass hunger, uh, there was starvation, there was disease, and they hoped that by joining the Khmer Rouge and by then following the orders, they would be able to, um, they would be able to have an easier life. They would have better food. They would have more rest. They would, um, the people in the killing groups only had to kill, and I say that in inverted commas, but what that meant was, um, when there wasn't anyone to be killed, they could rest. And that was a stark contrast to the people who were working for hours and hours in the rice fields. And many fell over of exhaustion and died in the rice fields. So this, within this, this context, it becomes understandable that lots of them hoped for this. They hoped for more security. Um, they hoped that it, by being a Khmer Rouge cadre, they would um, be safer. Um, this, this logic didn't really work out because many, many Khmer Rouge cadres themselves uh, were arrested um, as internal traitors. Um, various processes of um, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge managed to dehumanize uh, the victims. They managed to sort of persuade their cadres that, um, that killing these people uh, was like killing ducks and chickens, a process that um, these people who had been farmers prior to the revolution uh, were very familiar with, and that their life, the, the life of these traitors, was worth um, nothing. Um, and I'd like to um, point out a, a quite a strong difference to, um, to other cases. I've also, in my work, looked a little bit at um, the Holocaust and in the Rwandan genocide, and their social dynamics within the within the group is very important. But the Khmer Rouge had a very different system. They, immediately after you were recruited, you were sent to a different part of the country, and you were instantly instilled with fear of the other people in your unit because they may denounce you as a traitor. And so there was very hmm. much a sort of a feeling of social isolation. So these people, um, were scared of their comrades, um, they didn't know their victims, and this really made it a lot easier for them to just participate in the orders that they were being given. Now, at the same time um, as being perpetrators, um, some explicitly claim to be victims, some of my interviewees, um, but most of them don't claim this explicitly, but in, their, in, the, in the stories they tell me, they very much portray themselves as um, equal victims to the rest of the population. Now, this may strike us as strange. It's like an SS um, functionary uh, saying that he's a victim of the Nazi regime. But what they, um, what they portray is that they also were hungry. 
um, they were also overworked. And primarily, and this is the most important thing, they say we also all lost family members. Every person in Cambodia has at least one family member who died during the regime. And that also counts for the people who, are, um, who were Khmer Rouge cadres. And so they, and this is obviously very important, and so from this they, they managed to sort of buy into this, this victim uh, narrative. And also they said they were constantly um, fearful for their own lives um, because as a Khmer Rouge cadre, you had the most uh, potential to undermine the revolution and be an internal traitor. Mo uh, there's a higher percentage of Khmer Rouge cadres were actually arrested and killed than people who were part of the normal population. In absolute numbers, it wasn't, it was obviously uh, normal civilians who died more, but in terms of percentage, uh, relative numbers, um, actually you had a higher chance of being arrested if you were a Khmer Rouge cadre. And so they say, we were also scared. Many of my colleagues were also killed. Um, so we see these Khmer Rouge cadres can easily be called perpetrators. They were the ones who implemented these genocidal policies of the Khmer Rouge regime. But they also um, claim victimhood for themselves. And also, in a sort of a third facet, um, they claim to be heroes and to have rescued people in various ways. Um, for instance, this man here, these, by the way, these are all photos um, which the photographer Daniel Welschenbach um, took, uh, who's a colleague of mine, um, of their, and they're all um, people who I interviewed. Um, and this man here, he was a, a Khmer Rouge leader in a commune, um, so quite a, a large area, and he, he portrays himself as a hero because in his position as commune leader, he had to give the orders to arrest and kill people. And he said that he often would cross some of the names off the list, um, thus saving these people. Or he would sign off on the list and then go to one of the people who was on the list and warn them so they could flee. Um, now, this, this does make him a rescuer, um, but at the same time also he's signing off on the lists uh, where many, many other people do die. Um, but he, in his, in his narratives, very much highlights uh, his, his function as a rescuer. Um, on the other side, we have here a, um, a local uh, f uh, Khmer Rouge uh, female leader. So she was in charge of a working group uh, for women. And she said that she uh, tried to look after the people in her, um, in her group. And when some of them were working slowly because they were sick or, um, or as she said, because they'd been lazy for a day, um, she would sometimes try and cover for them and say that normally they work really well. Um, and, but she also said very clearly that as soon as it got more difficult, as soon as people started asking more questions about these people, she would then no longer protect them. As soon as it was her own life which would possibly be at stake, um, she would then take a step back. Um, she also let the people working under her go out at night and collect food for themselves, which was highly illegal. Uh, you were only allowed to eat uh, during uh, collective meal times. Anyone found eating, even if it was just grass or dirt, uh, could be killed, because this was seen, again, as undermining the collective revolution. Um, but she let her people go out and collect food, and then they would eat it um, together. And so she sees herself as being a sort of a, a resistor within the regime. Um, yeah, and so today, um, here on the left we see uh, Tul Sleng uh, Genocide Museum, which was also in the uh, in the documentary, as well as Chung Ai, the Killing Fields, uh, which also featured in the documentary. Um, two pictures, which are the main uh, memorial sites in Cambodia today. Now. The relations, I have a few more minutes, and I'd like to speak about how the relations are today. Um, now, in some communities, um, people who were members of the Khmer Rouge and were responsible for the victimization of individuals uh, live together with people who uh, have family members who were, for instance, killed by them. Um, and here, there are still tensions. 
But for the most people, as I said earlier, when they, as soon as they were recruited, they were sent to a different part of the country. And so for most people, they are no longer in the communities in which they perpetrated their crimes. And, um, and so there's an acceptance quite broadly um, across Cambodia that many of these former Khmer Rouge cadres are indeed victims. And they buy into this narrative uh, particularly because of the loss of their family members. Because the people returned home after the end of the Khmer Rouge regime in the liberated areas, people all returned home, um, both uh, former Khmer Rouge and non-former Khmer Rouge, everyone could go back to their home villages. And then what people primarily saw was who wasn't there, the people who had been lost. And so um, for this, there's a sort of a, I call it universal victimhood, where everyone can buy into this. Um, and in the documentary, um, we saw very, very nicely the politics of the 1980s. Um, the, the Hun Sen's government, Hun Sen is still in power today, um, uh, and he's had different types of politics over time. But from um, the liberation through the, of the, by the Vietnamese throughout the 1980s, there was a politics of anger um, and of hate. And the Khmer Rouge were very much demonized because of this ongoing civil war. And you could see that very much in some of the quotes of the various people about how there's pent up anger in them, how the Khmer Rouge are this evil force, they're still out there, they want to take back uh, Phnom Penh and turn it back into a, uh, a genocidal site. But then in the 1990s, um, Hun Sen changed his rhetoric and um, introduced what he called a win-win policy. And what that meant was anyone could defect from the Khmer Rouge into the government forces and would get an amnesty. And this worked wonders. Um, unit after unit of the Khmer Rouge um, defected um, into the government forces. And so this rhetoric of demonization was taken away and was focused only on the the, the units which wouldn't affect, and particularly on the highest leaders. And so bit by bit, everyone, all the units, came over to the government forces and could then buy into this narrative of victimhood. Um, and then at the end of the 1990s, when the Civil War was over, Hun Sen still remained in power. Um, and under the pressure of the international community, um, introduced an international well, a hybrid tribunal between the UN and Cambodian um, staff members. And interestingly, you would expect this to lead to a certain amount of accountability, but it still um, very much fits into this win-win um, narrative in the sense that so far, only five people have been put on trial, only the very highest leaders. And everyone else is still allowed to buy into this idea of being victims to the degree that it's... Um, well, it's, a, it's a, an innovation in terms of international criminal law, um, but victims are allowed to become civil parties um, at the court. And there's no, and uh, it's not clear how many, but a significant am amount, um, some people say 20%, some people say even maybe more than that, are former Khmer Rouge cadres who are civil parties, so they're presenting themselves legally as victims of the Khmer Rouge regime at this tribunal. And so this all feeds into the general picture today that these people um, uh, are victims. Um, do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah? Two. Two. Okay. Then, um, okay. So I think uh, here uh, we can see a new, um, what's well, called, uh, well, it's a monument to the people who were killed at Tulsleng prison. And Tulsleng prison is really interesting because it's in the middle of Phnom Penh. It's probably the tour most touristy place in Phnom Penh. Uh, everyone has to go there uh, if they visit the country. Um, but this was the highest prison in the, um, in the Khmer Rouge security system. And um, a vast majority of the people who were killed here are um, former Khmer Rouge because it was a, it was 
for the purges, um, and, and it was the most important, the most treacherous people came here. So maybe some of you know these, uh, these famous uh, photos uh, that we know from Cambodia where you see their sort of mug shots which were taken when people came in. There was a big exhibition at Met in, um, in New York. And these are, these are all the prisoners at Tul Sleng Prison. And so the vast majority of these, um, probably about 80%, um, are former Khmer Rouge cadres as well, who in this uh, whole um, presentation at the, at the museum are also presented as victims. And Interestingly, when this uh, monument was being built, um, you can see here there are black marble. Um, there are 16 black marble slabs, uh, which have ingrained in them, uh, engraved in them, the names of all the people who were killed at this place. Um, and uh, one uh, activist uh, tried to. Uh, make sure that only people who were not Khmer Rouge cadres uh, would be engraved in this, um, so that you wouldn't be memorializing as a victim someone who had also been a perpetrator. In the end, his voice was quite lonely, and um, there was a little bit of a debate, but in the end, it all went back to normal, and this, this narrative of universal victimhood um, won out, and so um, today you can see the names of these people listed as victims who were the highest, uh, some of the mid and high level cadres of the Khmer Rouge. Um, and I think it's an interesting case um, to show how um, legitimate ideas of victimhood, they did suffer as well, but they were also perpetrators, but how t over time the various policies of the government have brought this together to be quite an quite a contradictory but also an empowering narrative because today in Cambodia there is a strong degree of at least superficial reconciliation within the population. Okay, I think with that I will stop. Uh, for uh, for this very informative presentation. Uh, we will have more time, more room for a broader discussion, uh, but just for now, um, let's collect a couple of questions uh, concerning um, the precise uh, facts uh, that you just presented. Uh, if there is a need for clarification or an additional explanation of, um, of some of the issues that uh, Tim has presented, um, well, it is time for it now. So we'll collect, collect the questions. And um, Mario, you go first. I would just uh, remind everybody to speak to the microphone because of the need for interpretation. Well, first I would like to uh, applaud you for the work you've done. I think that it's really very, very important what you've done. Uh, and I look forward to reading, if it gets published, I hope it gets published, your work, uh, because it's really extremely important. The question concerns your um, optimism, if I can say, regarding the reconciliation process. Now, um, from what I have read, the opinions vary as to how successful it has been. On the one hand, yes, you've had uh, a few of the top uh, officials who have been sentenced, and I believe one or two of them have been sentenced for life. Um, but then the law which created this very unique tribunal, which includes uh, international judges and local judges, uh, stipulates that only the top cadre can be investigated and punished if found guilty. Um, now, the whole process of reconciliation is, is not just the tribunal, because what about education? I mean, uh, last year, I believe, was the first time that a textbook was issued 
um, which actually mentioned the Khmer Rouge. Beforehand, apparently, textbooks didn't even mention uh, this uh, important fact. So where you have only just recently a textbook uh, discussing or mentioning the, the genocide, um, it seems to me that it's a, it's a little bit late in the day when uh, these things are coming uh, um, into, into the public uh, domain. So uh, my, my, my question is, uh, on what do you base your, your optimism? Well, that's not a simple question, I suppose. But before we get into that, um, as we agreed, let's, let's collect any more specific questions that may arise. Yes, there is one, please. Mm -hmm. At the back, on the right side. Yes, you need the mic, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, where did uh, um, uh, Khmer Rouge uh, the support from? Um, what I heard is uh, they uh, were supported by the Chinese and the, by, uh, by the American as well, uh, because the American uh, wanted to, um, to damage the Vietnamese. Is it true? Um, because uh, uh, during, uh, f what is, uh, what is the, uh, the, uh, the support from uh, during the, the um, civil war and after the war? That's my question. Okay, thank you. If we don't have any more specific questions just for now, uh, Please try and answer them. Okay. Um, I'll start with the second question. Um, the Khmer Rouge had support by different uh, countries at different points of time. So during the Civil War, which brought them to power, um, they were very heavily supported by the Vietnamese and also to a degree um, by the Chinese. While they were in power, um, they turned on the Vietnamese uh, who had brought them into power. Um, but they still enjoyed um, quite strong support by, um, by the Chinese. But only after the Vietnamese invasion, after they'd been um, toppled and they went into the second civil war, then it's exactly like you said. Uh, the Western, uh, Western countries, including first and foremost the, the Americans, continued, or no, started to support um, the Khmer Rouge as, uh, and in, in, indeed, until the early 90s, the Khmer Rouge held the, um, the seat of, the, of Cambodia at the UN. Um, you have to imagine that a country which had killed or had let a quarter of their population die under their rule continued to hold the seat at the UN um, for geopolitical reasons of not wanting to uh, let the Vietnamese uh, be the winners um, of this and be and be portrayed in a positive light. Um, yeah, in, in brief. So over various points of time, they've enjoyed different uh, different sponsors, um, and uh, it's it's definitely a a shameful chapter in the uh, in the history of uh, <laughs> well, many one of the many chapters uh, in which. Uh, well, Western, Western countries have not been on the right side um, of, of history. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you, you're looking forward to my publication. Uh, there will be a book hopefully next year. Uh, there are a couple of uh, academic journal articles already out there, um, but the book will hopefully come next year. Um, I am optimistic about um, the reconciliation process. Um, I'd like to start with one of the th things you said first, um, that it's quite late in the day. Yes. I mean, the Khmer Rouge uh, was toppled 38 years ago. However, when you think about the fact that there was a, an ongoing civil war, um, a UN administration, actually the time frame is a lot shorter until you can really start, sort of call it a post-conflict um, society. And I think for me the question is, um, on the, when we're talking about the uh, ECCC, the hybrid tribunal, um, do we want justice or do we want reconciliation? And yeah, and are these even uh, at odds with each other? But I would say definitely that justice has not been done uh, for what happened uh, under the Khmer Rouge. Um, 
because, yes, there have been three people sentenced. Okay, two of them had life imprisonment, but still, that cannot be justice for two million people who have died. Um, but at the same time, if the, uh, my optimism is that in the communities, um, the, the relations between individual people seem to be a lot better by not having processes, for instance, like there were in Rwanda, where there, was, there were Gachacha local trials, where every person who had some role was brought uh, before a tribunal and was sentenced. And that's created huge tensions in, in um, the communities. And it may not be just that these people will never, um, will never be punished, but at the same time, um, it may, might be better for, for society. Um, I think, the, I mean, the ECCC's mandate um, was very much uh, a negotiation process between Hun Sen government and um, and the UN, and I think the UN would have—I mean, the UN would have liked much broader trials. Um, but as they very briefly mentioned in the documentary, Hun Sen is a former uh, commander of the Khmer Rouge who defected. Um, but if one looked too closely at what he did at certain points of time, you could probably also bring um, a case against either him or at least some people in his government. Um, and so. Uh, in the interest of being able to have a tribunal at all, the UN agreed to just being the, the highest leaders. Um, at the moment, there are supposed to be new trials, uh, which will probably not go ahead. Uh, so it was going to be a few more people, um, but it doesn't look like the, like Consen's government is going to allow that to happen. Um, but there are but the reconciliation process is broader than just the the judicial. And one of the things you mentioned was the education system, and that has changed, and I would say probably to a large degree also through the ECCC being there and starting to talk about the topic. The, the textbook that you mentioned uh, was introduced, I think, six or seven years ago, and it's already, um, all teachers have now been trained to use it, all history teachers, um, and... Uh, it's, I think a million copies were distributed to schools around the country. So there is now a much keener sense that um, schools should be talking about it. Prior to that, I think there were four sentences in the entire curriculum um, of this, this period of time, which for the country is so important. Um, and also besides that, there are also a number of NGOs um, working uh, on various facets of reconciliation and transitional justice from all sorts of different perspectives. And most of their work has also come up in the last um, 10 years, maybe in the last 15 years, on the, on the coattails of the tribunal. So even if the justice in the sort of the narrow um, judicial sense has not been served, a lot has happened through the tribunal and a lot of um, processes of talking about the past, dealing with the past, um, negotiating memory of the past has um, started. Um, and to a certain degree, maybe some of this is a little bit superficial. Um, maybe some of it is communities just saying we're not going to, we're not going to reopen these wounds. Um, but it does facilitate the communities carrying on. It does facilitate um, people being able to continue in their lives and rebuild their lives. Um, and I think, I think that that's useful. I mean, also, there's a different sense of what needs to be done to deal with the past in Cambodia. It's a, it's a different culture to, um, to, if we can talk about a European culture. I mean, uh, there's a different idea of what do we need to forgive. Um, there isn't really this sort of um, Judeo-Christian idea of forgiveness. Um, it's more of an idea of karma, for instance, and that they don't need to necessarily be punished now because they may be punished in their next life. Um, and it's, it's a, maybe a slightly alien concept to us, but it, to, to sort of take reconciliation processes seriously, we also need to remember that it's a different culture and that there may be different expectations of what a, a, um, a transitional justice process needs to bring. Thank you, that, that is very interesting. Uh, it is not the end of our conversation um, tonight, it is the beginning. Uh, but we just need a short technical break for the interpreter. Um, 
I would invite the other panelists to take to the stage. A ja, proszę Państwa, wykorzystam tę krótką przerwę techniczną, aby rozdać Państwu informacje o Stowarzyszeniu Nigdy Więcej, które jest jednym ze współorganizatorów naszego spotkania dzisiejszego w języku polskim i angielskim. Potrwa to minutę albo dwie. All right, we shall continue with, with, with the conversation as, as promised. Um, and I think we'll have enough time for, for a broader debate uh, um, uh, focusing on Cambodia, but also going beyond, uh, uh, beyond Cambodia uh, uh, itself. Um, uh, let, me, let me present uh, the other panelists. Uh, Dara Bramson has just recently arrived from the United States. Uh, um, uh, she is a, a, an author and a writer uh, who has worked with the uh, Auschwitz Jewish Center as well as um, uh, the New York Museum of Jewish Heritage. Um, Natalia Sniaeva Pankowska um, has uh, uh, cooperated uh, with the Never Again Association here in Poland and uh, she has worked with um, institutions such as the um, uh, Museum of the History of um, Polish Jews uh, in Warsaw and other, other institutions. Um, Ali Al-Asani uh, is the director of the Heinrich Bell Foundation uh, in Cambodia. And well, I'd like to say he has come especially from Cambodia uh, for our event with just a few days in, in Germany in, in between. And, um, and Ali is, is, is going back to Phnom Penh next week, I believe. Uh, so we are very lucky and, and honored to, to have him uh, w with us um, uh, in Warsaw tonight. Um, well, as it happened, all of us uh, participated in a very memorable um, event organized by the Heinrich Bell uh, Foundation in uh, Phnom Penh in January uh, this year. 
uh, that was um, a discussion on genocide commemoration um, um, uh, uh, in, in both Cambodian and um, global uh, context. And uh, I'm very, very happy that we can meet again uh, in Warsaw um, at this time. And it's not my job to, to talk too much uh, tonight, um, but just, I, I just wanted to say something uh, briefly about um, the Polish-Cambodian connection. Obviously, both countries are far from each other, um, but it was not entirely accidental uh, uh, that, that we had a panel on the day of the liberation of Auschwitz in, in Phnom Penh in January. Um, the German ambassador was, was present there. Unfortunately, the Polish ambassador wasn't present there for the simple reason that the Polish embassy in Cambodia um, was closed down several, several years ago uh, because of uh, uh, budget cuts, which is a pity. Um, and I just wanted to uh, mention this book, um, uh, Zbigniew Domarańczyk, Kampucza, Godzina Zero, Kampucza, Hour Zero, is the title. Uh, this is the original edition from early 1981. Uh, the book is written by a Polish journalist who happened to be one of the first foreign journalists in Phnom Penh in Jan January 79. Um, at a time when very few, if any, foreigners, especially foreign media, were allowed into Cambodia just after the liberation, just after the overthrow of the, of the Khmer Rouge regime. And, and the Polish journalist managed to persuade um, a representative of, of the new uh, Cambodian government um, by telling him about Polish history. That's the way he persuaded him uh, in, uh, to issue uh, permission to enter uh, Cambodia. He told him about uh, the history, the Polish experience of the Nazi occupation and about Auschwitz. And uh, apparently the, the Cambodian representative was, was moved and agreed for the Polish journalist to, um, um, to visit Phnom Penh in order to tell the world about uh, the tragedy that, that had taken place uh, uh, in, in Cambodia. Okay, let's move on uh, to, um, um, to the perspectives of, um, of the panelists. Uh, and I would like to start with Dara. Uh, you have studied Polish history, you have studied Cambodian experience. Um, um, your, your perspective is obviously very, very broad. Uh, um, Tim um, has mentioned the difficulty around the concept of justice, uh, but I want to ask you about the concept of healing uh, in a post-conflict, post-genocide uh, um, situation. Um, what methods of healing are available apart from the legal procedure of justice? Thank you. Um, the concept of healing is something that I was introduced to when I started working in Poland because I found that in informal spaces of dialogue when there was opportunities for people to share and speak, it got out of control to the point where everyone had something to share. So it wasn't just one person sharing and getting a bit of feedback, but it was actually a therapeutic space for many people to share their stories and their histories, no matter what their age was. And earlier in Tim's presentation, he mentioned that almost everyone in Cambodia has a family member, if not more, who suffered from this regime. And when I came to Poland, I found that the same theme 
really resonated with me because almost everyone I met had a story and every conversation at a bar became a very intense therapeutic session of people sharing their stories. So in my work in Poland, uh, organizing academic programs and working for a museum, I began to organize kind of informal gatherings and spaces where people could share. And I was shocked, really, how many people came to ostensibly listen, but actually what happened was they were sharing more than they were listening. Uh, and that was actually the theme that I found, I would say, informally in Cambodia as well, and even during our conference earlier this year, which is we had these unbelievable talks and discussions, and at the end of each of them, really each of them, it ended with mostly local people standing up and not really asking a question, but sharing not just a one minute thought, but like 20 minutes of their personal history because it was a space that was open and welcome to that. So I think in terms of healing, that's really a first step is even having gatherings such as this, where we're addressing history in a comfortable and open and um, uh, sort of a way that opens dialogue for people to know that there is a possibility and potential to exchange and there was a wonderful quote from one of our speakers in, during the conference who said, uh, a great listener will help you heal. And I think this quote stood out to me as really one of the most important informal methods of healing that I'm finding is very important here in Poland and also in my experience is happening more and more in Cambodia, thankfully. Um, I think that just touches on it. There's much more, but I can go in later if we have time. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, now I would like to ask a question to Natalia. Um, you, you, you have dealt with Holocaust commemoration in, in, in Poland, in Eastern Europe. Do you think it has any relevance uh, for the commemoration of uh, other genocides, for example, in Cambodia? Uh, so we are talking today about Cambodia and uh, my research has been focused on Holocaust and memory and Holocaust denial in Eastern Europe. So I'd like somehow to combine uh, my experience. I have visited Cambodia uh, in the beginning of this year with my perspective as a researcher of a Holocaust memory, Holocaust denial. So uh, it, it has been commonly accepted uh, that the Holocaust of European Jewry uh, is a unique and unprecedented event in history. And uh, Judah Bauer, uh, Zygmunt Bauman have written on the topic because of its totality, because of the scale, geography, uh, it is unique. But uh, uh, the uniqueness debate actually has started more than two decades ago and it has like, it had uh, like three levels. First of all, a uniqueness of a Jewish suffering, uh, but also um, uh, suffering of various groups under Nazi German occupation, like Jews, Roma, and other groups. And the third aspect is a uniqueness uh, of a Holocaust in the context of our genocide in history. So the third aspect, the, the third aspect is the most sensitive and is the most difficult to discuss actually and I, I believe that I agree that we should talk about the Holocaust uniqueness and uh, the end of a uniqueness deba debate could mean uh, a kind of normalization historization of a, of a Holocaust, which is also quite dangerous, yes. But at the same time, I also believe that we need to talk uh, about Holocaust in the conce concept, uh, context of other genocide history. First of all, because uh, Holocaust has happened, uh, and uh, when we have some other genocides happened in Cambodia, in Rwanda, so we still need to know uh, what lessons have we learned from the Holocaust experience and why it still happens. So in this context, I believe we could still um, 
need to talk about Holocaust uh, uh, in the context of our genocide. And uh, I have been working for, for the museum, and this is also my experience, and I actually have visited many uh, Holocaust museums in Europe, but also in other countries, in the United States. And uh, I have noticed that many museums today, for example, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, the Holocaust Museum in uh, Tkuma, in Dnipropetrovsk, in, uh, in Ukraine, for example, all of them, they have uh, temporary exhibitions, and somehow they try to incorporate other genocide in, in, into the museum narrative, for example. We have temporary, for, now we have a temp, there is a temporary exhibition about Cambodia at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., so they also, believe, they also see that this is a challenge we still need to work with. So I think this is very important to, to, to talk about the Holocaust also in the, com, com, in the context of our genocide, but not to compare, as I said, because it could be also a kind of, uh, um, kind of danger, yes, because of this. And I don't know if I can say something else. Yeah, uh, I would like also to uh, to draw attention to to Tim's presentation. You have shown some some pictures um, from memorial sites in Cambodia. Actually, uh, when I have visited Cambodia, it was very, I would say, difficult experience for me. Uh, we visited different places. I have noticed that uh, there are actually only two memorial sites, yes, um, uh, former prison as 21 and the killing field. So, but violence has happened in the whole country, in all, you know, in all parts of the country, but it's still not somehow marked, yes. And um, it's still a challenge for Cambodian society, I believe, to, to mark out places, to work with this. And I would like also later to listen to Tim's perspective on this. And I, uh, I was also, I also noticed uh, and we saw pictures, yes, uh, they display, they display bones, they display, you know, uh, uh, so uh, horror Scalps, pictures, maybe. yes, scalps, you know. And I was thinking a lot, why? Yes, because we know today that um, Holocaust museums, they try to, uh, to minimize usage of uh, such drastic photos because, because of for different reasons. Uh, but also because it has a different impact of visitors. But I was thinking, why? and now I think that because this Cambodian society still didn't rework its trauma, yes, and somehow they tried to prevent um, this denial what happened, yes. So they use all these artifacts, original artifacts, uh, to, to show that it's happened. So maybe unintentionally, so because I was thinking a lot, it, it shocked me in Cambodia, to be honest, yes, uh, to see it, and uh, I think it, because we're still, how to say, sensitive, we're still not strong, yes, to see what it happened, we still need to re rework this aspect, so. Thank you. So I would like also to, lis to listen to your opinion about this. Thank you. I, I, I think we, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in, in a moment, and what you just mentioned, well, touches upon Tim's point about cultural differences in, in approaching uh, memory um, um, and uh, cultural differences in, 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 in terms of commemoration. Um, and this is a question that I would like to direct to, to, to Ali now. Do you think with your experience of, of uh, working in, in Cambodia for a long time now, uh, knowing about the German culture of, of commemoration, do you think the differences are more striking or, or the commonalities? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, I, I would rather think that it's two different societies with different approaches. Um, not only on the level of, of the nation, but also on the level of the in individual person. Um, and I would make the link to, to, to trauma. Um, you saw the, the, the woman in the film, Miss Var, she said at, at one point, what's past is past. And this is a, a common approach in, in Cambodia to not talk about uh, what had happened. 
Um, and uh, a little bit later she says, there comes a point where you can't cry anymore, which relates to trauma. Um, as far as I can see, the Cambodian society until today is very much traumatized um, due to the fact that um, there are, is not much of uh, psychological support. We have to admit this. And also because of the, the concept that, um, that Tim rightly related to, uh, the concept of karma, uh, which says, okay, they did something wrong, so they will be punished uh, later. But in my uh, opinion and what I see in, in Cambodia, this concept does not help very much when it comes to, to overcoming trauma. Um, there are some, some activities when it comes to com commemoration and uh, also funded by, by Western countries, also by, by Germany. But this is only one part of, of dealing with the past. There are other um, activities like documenting, research, researching, um, and uh, um, still there, there's lots, lots to be done on this. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that would be a good moment to, to open up uh, uh, the discussion if there are more, um, more comments or more questions um, and not only about Cambodia, but you know, more broadly um, issues of uh, dealing with the past and, and commemoration. Uh, I think it would be a good moment to exchange the, the, um, the, the comments uh, just now. Przy czym proszę Państwa zachęcam też do tego, żeby też w języku polskim się wypowiadać. Mamy, mamy możliwość tłumaczenia. Także bardzo zapraszam do zabierania głosu. A, a świetnie. Mhm. Aha, to tak, najpierw Panu oddamy głos, a potem Mario. Tak, tylko proszę o mówienie do mikrofonu, aby można to było przetłumaczyć. I, I, I would like to find out... I would like to find out how the, the life of people of Cambodia looks now, and especially about the political views. Uh, what, what, what countries today have good relationship with Cambodia and the ones uh, which are in conflict with the country? Okay, Tim, would you like to respond? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'll respond to that question first, and then I'd like to also make a couple of comments, um, particularly to Natalia. Um, well, I think Cambodian life today is, um, well, I spend a lot of time in the provinces, uh, in, in villages um, across the country, and it's, uh, Cambodia is one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia. Um, it has a, a, a huge problem in that it lost... Um, almost all its intellectuals uh, in the late 70s under the Khmer Rouge. And it's very, very hard to build up a new education system, a new health system, a new um, legal system without people who have um, education. Um, and so I, you can still feel those effects until today. But through, ex I mean, very, very high levels of... Uh, of Western uh, financial intervention um, since the late 1990s or the mid-1990s. Uh, development is coming to the country. Um, infrastructure is being built. Um, uh, and particularly, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the West, um, Europe and, and the United States uh, have given a lot in terms of development aid. Um, and China is investing heavily uh, in terms of building factories uh, and and infrastructure um, but it's t I mean well, Cambodia is also one of the most corrupt countries in the world um, so a lot of the profits which have been uh, accrued through the the slow process of development are concentrated in the hands of very few people um, and there's a very very s small middle class in Phnom Penh but they are primarily uh, in the NGO sector. Um, I mean, I think Ali can probably answer these questions a little bit in more detail than I can, but I see that as quite um, problematic for the long-term development of the country, um, that it's not very um, business-oriented. Um, in terms of memorialization in Cambodia, 
there are various projects outside Phnom Penh as well. I mean, towards Slang and Chiang Mai, the two, the killing fields and the prison that we, we saw, um, are the most famous sites, um, primarily because they are also tourist sites. That's where all the tourists go. Cambodians don't often visit these sites, which is one of the problems which uh, the, the people who run these uh, sites are encountering. Um, and what you do see all over the country are these stupas. So like um, it's these, these towers which have skulls and bones um, towered up in them as a memorial site. Now, actually, interestingly, it's not cultural at all to have skulls and bones. Actually, it goes very much against the Buddhist tradition that says that the spirit of the person will only be able to be freed from the body and reincarnated into the next life when the body has been burned. So actually, by not by putting these, uh, by enshrining the the skulls and the bones, actually you're preventing the people from being born again. Um, so it's extremely uncomfortable for a lot of um, Cambodians to have these uh, these um, or well, this form of memorialization. But the the idea behind it was a political one. It's that you wanted to, on the one hand, shock the Western community, particularly the two sites in Phnom Penh. You wanted to shock them and show, look. We, the Vietnamese, have come to Cambodia, we've liberated the country from this terrible regime beforehand. And so you needed to demonstrate how horrific the regime was beforehand by showing very viscerally um, what this regime did. But also then to use this as evidence, um, ongoing evidence, so that if you, there's a sort of an idea that if you burn it, it'll be gone and people can start denying that it happened. Um, I think these, I mean, even today, um, so, I mean, some Cambodians say that, well, what happened in Tul Sleng was all, uh, it was just a, an invention of the, of the Vietnamese. And so there's still very much an idea that then you need to justify, um, justify what happened. Um, I'd also like to very briefly just note, um, I am, my training is as a comparative political scientist. So I'm very much, um, I have a very clear stance on the idea of the uniqueness debate um, in the sense that I, I think, um, and in, in my research, I've done sort of explicit comparisons between the Holocaust, um, the Rwandan genocide, and the Cambodian genocide. And I think it's actually very fruitful to not think of these cases as unique. They're all unique in, uh, in that they had very different contexts. Um, they're unique in that even within each of these various genocides, different localities saw different dynamics happening. But I think it's really productive for us to, to try and compare them because these things ha do keep happening and again and again. Uh, and hopefully at some point we will be able to have said never again. But uh, so far the evidence has showed us that it does keep happening again and again. And by, be by not seeing these as unique, we can see what are the political and the social um, frameworks within which this keeps happening? Um, and how can we maybe then use these to, to, um, to prevent it from happening again? So I, I, I'm, I, I just wanted to sort of say that I have a very strong opinion on the ter on the, in terms of uniqueness. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know whether any of you would like to comment on anything that has been said. Tak, tak, już sekundeczkę, sekundeczkę. Mm. Aha, przepraszam. To, Mario, to jeszcze za chwilę. Tak, mm -hmm. tak jest. Do, do mikrofonu prosimy. Jaki jest stan zabytków Kambodży, czyli Angor? W jakim jest stanie? Czy jest remontowany? would like to answer what is the condition of Angkor and other um, sites of heritage? Just, just a question, question of clarification. Uh, you, mean, you mean the old temples of Angkor what? Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but this is the main tourist site and it, much money is going into this preservation uh, site and um, the German government is also uh, supporting the preservation of the old temples but um, uh, there's still also still a, a lot a lot to be done I, I think a, a quite an interesting thing is that 
um, the, the Khmer Rouge were, were aggressively anti-Buddhist. Um, so a lot of the temples around the country were destroyed under the regime. And a lot of them were actually used as um, security centers and sites of torture. But the Angkor temples themselves, even though they have this religious tradition, they, even more than being anti-religious, they were nationalistic. And it was very much seen that Angkor Wat and the other temples of Angkor were so much part of the Cambodian soul, part of the Cambodian tradition, that this nationalism trumped the anti-religious uh, sentiments of the regime. And even to the degree that the Khmer Rouge had on their national flag Angkor Wat, which, I mean, given the, their, their stance towards religion is, seems ridiculous, but it's because they had this very, very nationalistic... Um, uh, stands. Thank you. Okay, Mario, please. I would like to just go back, if I can, to Tim and the reconciliation process uh, very briefly, if I can. Um, you are quite right, of course, to, to note that these things can take a long, long time, and it has taken a long time in Europe to come to terms with the past. I mean, but the problem is, f from my perspective, is that if you look at, for example, a writer like uh, Robert Carmichael, I believe, he, who wrote about uh, the tragedy in Cambodia, he has pointed out that most of these initiatives are all NGOs and coming from the tribunal and that very little, according to him, comes from the grassroots. Now, if you look in Europe, and you look at, for example, in Germany, where you had the Historica Streich, you had internal debate amongst Germans, German intellectuals, uh, which was an important step to coming to terms. And you can easily find that also in other countries. In Poland here, too, there have been very important debates regarding dark chapters uh, in Polish history. And my question is, has the same thing started to happen amongst Cambodians themselves? Have they started to discuss, even acrimoniously, about this dark past? I can answer that very quickly. The answer is no. Um, I think um, maybe I will have a slightly different perspective on this than me. That I am, I'm quite negative in terms of what I, how I perceive, perceive this. Um, yes, the, the reconciliation process is driven by, uh, by NGOs, by the tribunal, and, prim and above all by international money. Um, it, it's part of the development complex uh, in Cambodia. That doesn't mean it's not accepted or wished for by the um, Cambodian population. Um, I would say anything in terms of development is financed and pushed by the international community. This is the same for education, for healthcare. Um, the government of Hun Sen uh, doesn't have a feeling of responsibility uh, in terms of provision for uh, any of the of the basic needs of uh, of the country, um, and in in conversations uh, that I had with my interviewees, sometimes I mean when we weren't talking about the history, we would talk about sort of uh, their perceptions today, and they would say, "Oh, we need a healthcare system, or we need or we need a, a healthcare center here in this village, or we need new roads," and I would always make a point to ask, "Okay." Um, I understand that. Who, who should be providing this? And it was all, no one ever said the government. It was always the international community. So it's all, so this, this idea that it would be pushed by the international community is not surprising because that's, that's how things happen in Cambodia. And I don't, I, I do think that there is more agency of Cambodians today um, than there was 20 years ago. The, the, the international community isn't there doing the projects themselves. They're financing them, but they're done by local NGOs with people who are, who are Cambodian. Some of them have Western education. Um, some of them don't. Um, but they are pushing agendas, which they do tailor to the international expectations, but they are, they are developing their own ideas. But there is very little 
mm, discord in terms of interpretations of the past. Um, there's no there's no intellectual debate. Um, almost all the research which is done on the Khmer Rouge genocide is done by internationals. That is changing slowly but surely. And people um, like uh, my research assistant, uh, for instance, I mean, he, he was my research assistant because of the, the sort of the dynamics of the post-conflict society, but he is also doing his own research. Um, he, and he's also published a book. Um, but in the end, due to the, the really hard or the, the sort of the situation that the, the education system is not very good in Cambodia, they're not reaching the levels um, yet where they would be able to uh, engage in sort of similar levels of research. Um, but there are projects, and a lot of, the, of, of us international researchers are trying to do capacity building. I've just started a new project where we'll have four researchers in Cambodia um, who will be trained and who will be working with us. And so hopefully, bit by bit, I mean, it's a long process, obviously, but these, these intellectual capabilities will be enhanced, um, and maybe there will be more sort of these, these debates um, which emerge about certain interpretations of the past. Thank you. Ali, would you like to add something? Yeah, just um, uh, one, one aspect that I want, would like to mention. The Cambodian government is, is currently trying to implement two narratives. The first is that the Khmer Rouge regime existed from 75 to 79, whereas in fact they, they existed before and after this, this time frame. Um, and the second is that Hun Sen liberated the country, whereas in fact it was the Vietnamese army and uh, Hun Sen was just one of the, the soldiers. So these are two, um, two, two narratives which is, is clearly political, politically driven. Um, the question why there is no, polit the, no debate on this is very simple. Former Khmer Rouge are still active and in power in politics, in the Senate, in the ruling party, in economics. Many people simply don't dare to touch this issue. And, and I know also people who say, I don't want our children to work in politics because this is too dangerous. And uh, I'm quite pessimistic uh, on, on, a, on a public debate when it comes to this, um, as long as these guys are still in power. Um, thank you. Are there any more questions or comments at this moment? Uh, well, if not, then I would like, oh, there is. Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Just one more question. Um, uh, the um, Khmer Rouge uh, pretended to um, establish um, a social paradise, a kind of, a kind, a kind of social paradise. As we know, um, it was a kind of, uh, in reality, it uh, was a kind of uh, Stone Age communism. Uh, where uh, did they get the idea of this um, paradise or Stone Age communism from? Uh, was there any influ influence of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, maybe, or something like that? That's, that's a very interesting question, I think, and I think it's over to you, Tim. Um. Yes, uh, the, the, the foundation, the ideological foundations are Maoist, so it's very much driven from the, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Um, a delegation of the Khmer Rouge did uh, travel to, to China, uh, visited a model village, um, and also delegations from China came to Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge uh, regime and were very impressed with to what degree the Khmer Rouge... Um, leadership uh, <coughs> radically was implementing this idea of, an, uh, of a revolution. And, but Pol Pot was always very clear, and Nguyen Chia, sort of his second in command, was very clear that whatever um, vision they have for the country was going to be a specifically Cambodian one. That uh, anything needed to be tailor-made uh, for Cambodia, um, and so they did buy into uh, into these Maoist ideas, but they they merged them with this idea of Cambodian nationalism, for instance, that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so what came out was a very sort of a very specific uh, type of ideology, a very specific uh, vision. Um, and it was also, I mean, it was very much influenced also by wanting to uh, to disengage from 
the Western capitalist society to, to the most radical point possible, particularly from the imperial, the, the perception of an imperial US, because the Khmer Rouge was so much strengthened uh, during the civil war preceding that by the Vietnamese, the, the, the Vietnam War, because um, in, the, uh, in 1969, uh, the the Cambodian government allowed American planes to start bombing Cambodia as well in their search for the Viet Cong. And this created so much hostility towards the Americans because it's unclear how many, but several hundred thousand people were killed by American bombs. And so their, their idea of an anti-American, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist society fell on very, very fruitful um, ground. Well, now I would like to ask Dara again, uh, coming back to, to dealing with the past and um, dealing with the traumas and the concept of healing. Uh, um, we talked about uh, education, we talked about conversation, but could art be um, a tool of healing as well? Yes. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I will approach your question through the museum world and spaces because I think it's a very uh, accessible way to think about the sort of amorphous concept of healing um, and engagement. So certainly art is a very broad term and there are so many ways that we could examine how art and commemoration and art and um, uh, I guess justification or understanding or connection to the past is expressed. So I think one way that you can do this is just by walking down the street and looking at the walls. Uh, and this is something that I've become very interested in is actually how graffiti has become part of urban landscapes. Uh, so without even walking into an artistic space necessarily where you're paying for admission or you think you're going to an exhibition, actually the streets are in itself an exhibition space. Um, Rafa and I have spoken about this at length because I focus some of my research in the past few years on specific graffiti in Krakow, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, that relates to the rivalry between Krakowia and Wisła. And if you walk around Krakow very easily, you'll see graffiti that says either Jude Gang or Anta Jude. So for visitors who don't know these references to the sports teams, it's very alarming because people think that it's anti-Semitic graffiti. Well, actually, it's related to the sports rivalry. But still, this is a conversation and an expression of historical past bleeding into the present and connecting with uh, contemporary society. So related to healing from the past, I think what's become very interesting to me is um, related to a few points that just came up regarding international community involvement and societies both in Poland in some to some extent and uh, in Cambodia where people aren't necessarily ready to connect or address or relate to the past. And this is in the form of initiatives that use public spaces uh, that perhaps are connected to museums, but also possibly extending outside the scope of museums. And in Warsaw is such a great example of all of this because walking around the city even today, and I've been here many times, but you see this line on the floor where you see the outline of the Warsaw Ghetto Wall. Um, in Germany, of course, many cities that you go to, you walk around and you see these Stolperstein little uh, bronze squares in front of different homes that have the names, deportation dates, uh, various information about mostly Jewish victims of the Holocaust and where they were murdered. So these aspects of arti artistic engagement and healing um, are very much accessible to people even when they're not prepared or in a space where they think they're engaged in that dialogue and all of a sudden the public becomes part of that conversation. So I hope that's 
at least touching on your question, but I think that's uh, an excellent way if you're in such a beautiful, you know, all these incredible places to engage with history that you can feel that you're part of a dialogue, even if you aren't choosing to be. So. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to go back to Natalia now and, 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 and the point you raised in, in the beginning of, of the panel, um, the question of uniqueness and, and parallels. Uh, that's so dear to Tim. Uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, well, of course, the term killing fields is one that most people associate with Cambodia um, as a symbol of, um, of what happened there. Uh, but I think the same term has been used vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Nazi Holocaust in, in, in Transnistria in Moldova and Ukraine. Um, this may or may not be the coincidence, but do you see this as a challenge or as an opportunity for um, commemoration work um, that is more universal uh, and not just historical, not uh, just country specific? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think um, it is very important and it is universal because uh, you have mentioned Transnistria and my work is focused, has been focused on Transnistria and Moldova. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Transnistria, it's a part be between Ukraine and Moldova and historically now it belongs mostly to, to Ukraine. And uh, it was a site where many Moldovan Jews uh, and Roma have been murdered, yes, so, and uh, what we observe today in Moldova, in Transnistria, uh, that most of such places are unmarked, and after passing of so many years, yes, so 70 years, so uh, you could come to the village, which was like 90%, 80% inhabited by Jews, uh, before the war, now there are no Jews, and uh, many, most, well, all those, these Jews were killed somewhere nearby, yes, but uh, now local inhabitants, they just don't know about this, so and they don't know those places, you know, they just built uh, new houses, roads, you know, on those killing fields, so, uh, and so, you know, it, it was so long ago, so, and I think there is also, it's important now to think about it, yes, to, about preservation of these memorial sites, about marking these memorial sites. It's very important. So the challenge in a paradoxical way is uh, It's a universal, is similar. yes. It's, it's universal. It's mm -hmm. you know, it's... Mm -hmm. Thank you. But it is the, serm, the same term, killing fields. Yes, okay. yes, so... Um, Ali, if we talk about the legacy of, of the Cambodian uh, tragedy for, for Cambodian society today, what do you think are the, uh, the more general challenges facing Cambodia today? Not just uh, in terms of commemoration, but in terms of development. Well, I could, I could talk about, uh, I could talk f for hours about current challenges <laughs> when it comes to development, education. Uh, Tim rightly mentioned corruption. Um, but related to, to our topic, um, I would say that um, much research is to, is to be done. Uh, we, we just know very, very small amount what, uh, about what had happened, where it uh, had happened. Um, um, we are um, just starting the, the process of, of dealing with the past, and this is one of the um, main obstacles, maybe, to, to, to future development. Um, because Many people fear that the, the still today uh, that the Khmer Rouge might come back, but uh, I, I would say as long as we don't know and uh, as long as we don't deal with the past, it will always haunt us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I thought it was an interesting conversation. Obviously, we didn't exhaust all the all all all, all, all the diverse topics uh, raised. Uh, uh, I found it interesting. Um, and I, I would like to give the final word to Tim um, to summarize the conclusions of our session. 
Oh dear. Um, how do I summarize the last two hours? Um, okay. Well, I think. I mean, I think I've really appreciated um, being on this panel because I think what's been come very clear is that not only is the 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 case of Cambodia and what I tried to show in my talk was much more complex than maybe it seems at first sight in terms of what happened during the Khmer Rouge, but also how it's been dealt with over the years and how it's perceived today. But also that the the, the comparisons we can have to other other cases are also complex and there are parallels but there are also differences and I think um, the, the different facets what we understand as reconciliation what is justice, what is healing um, and the different methods we have there's no there's no solution which fits everything there's no path there's no trajectory where we can sit down and say this is what should have happened or this is what can happen but and that's why i think these kind of conversations where we come at it from our, our very different perspectives are so interesting to me because it it highlights that there's no right way of of doing this and there's no uh, and that we need to constantly engage in trying to reflect on how we're remembering the past and what that means for the present. Thank you very much again. I want to thank all the panelists now. Um, I want to thank um, everybody who came uh, and participated in this discussion. I, I don't know for sure if it was the first ever discussion about Cambodia in, in, in Warsaw, but it is definitely one of the first ones, and I, I very much hope it is not, not the last one. Um, so, once again, thank you all for coming and participating. <laughs>